Good evening. I'd like to welcome any visitors that are here, and uh, I hope they feel how special this place is. I felt it from the first time I came here. John baptized me just five years ago. That's why I'm as shocked as anybody to be standing up here before you. Um, this is the first time for me, so I'm not asking for pity, but <laughs> hopefully, hopefully all of you will have 911 on speed dial in case I stroke out of here. Um, so are my sisters and my wife who've known me the longest, Pam and Mary and Ann. Um, don't adjust your televisions. This is real. I, I've actually standing up here before you to lead us in a, a lesson, and five years ago I would have thought that impossible. I want to thank Ron and the elders for asking me. I remember three months ago when Ron asked me, and they said, uh, would, would you be able to lead us in a lesson? And uh, I didn't answer him right away, but I got back to him, and I thought about the op op uh, opportunity to grow, which is what this, the lesson is about today, is about growth. And I had people like, like uh, Tony and Tom encouraging me openly. He goes, someday you ought to get up there and do it. And I find it has helped me to grow. So I want to thank Ron for that. And uh, I, I, my family moved here in 1963 when Prescott was just a little town of 12,000. And uh, ended up going to Prescott High School where I started taking languages. And I would have never known how much that was going to help me by the time I got to age 65, I studied Latin and liked it, so I was the strange kid in school. Went on to Arizona State and I studied foreign language and Spanish and Portuguese and Latin. And um, during that time, I had a class in my senior year, Hispanic American Literature 428. I can't remember the teacher who tortured us in that, but for the... But for the final, part of the final test was not, was a um, term paper, 20 pages on a book that he selected for us. So he selected for me a book by an author, a Cuban author named Alejo Carpentier, and the name of the book was Los Pasos Perdidos, and reading for a non-native speaker in a foreign language is torture. It's, uh, you, it, it uses every bit of language common and formal, and so I had to read this book. And it was about a man who's not given a name. It's all written. The protagonist is in the first person. So there's no name, but he is searching. He goes for a, uh, he travels to the Orinoco jungle in um, Venezuela, searching for the meaning of life and the origins of time. Who would have thought 45 years later or 50 years later that that would have meaning to me. But um, he leads kind of a meaningless wandering through this jungle, which kind of represents life. And no growth, nothing to look forward to, a life in vain, just mere existence. And years later, I came to know about a story that was just like that, and it was a man named King Sisyphus. Now this does not look like king's work to me. Sisyphus was a king. He was wealthy. He lived in a castle. He had everything he could possibly want. But he was not a good man. And due to his misdoings, he had sentenced twice in his lifetime to death. But because he was kind of a con man and a conniver and a, a devilish man, he spoke and cheated his way out of death. Well, Zeus, again, this is Greek mythology, king of the gods, was not happy with him. And so when he died of natural death, Zeus condemned him to an eternity of rolling this immense boulder up the hill. And when he just about get to the pinnacle, it would roll back down. For eternity, this was his condemnation. So, um, I want you to think about for a minute 
How many people have chosen the life of Sisyphus to just roll that rock every day, one day blurring into the next, never realizing why God put us here in the first place? Well, the good news is that God has a plan for us. Let's look at Jeremiah 29.11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Something that Sisyphus sadly did not have. Most people are probably going to live their lives like Sisyphus. And coming to the end of their lives, they're not even going to realize why they were here. They're never, they'll never think about the fact that God has a plan for them. They, before they know it, it will all be over. And they will have missed the whole point of living. For God has a plan to sanctify us for the purpose of leading a godly life. Let's look at that word sanctified for just a minute. I know a lot of you uh, know it, but uh, holy, sanctified means holy. Um, or in the verb form, to sanctify is to make holy or to set apart or separate. And when we were sanctified, we were set apart by God, for God, for the holy purposes of God, to reflect the holy character of God in the person of Jesus Christ. The word saint, uh, the word sanctify not only means to be set apart, but it comes from the same word from which we get the word saint. And in 1 Corinthians 1-2, it says, To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. A few pieces of scripture about sanctification. 1 Corinthians 6.11 says, And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5.23 it says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we go through the lesson tonight, we're going to see how we grow into that. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 says, It is God's will that you should be sanctified. And then in verse 7 he says, For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. So, how do we begin a sanctified life? And you, many of you, or most of you, if not all of you, have seen this before. We hear the word of God. Romans ten seventeen. We believe it. Mark sixteen sixteen. We repent, we repent of our sins. We have a change of mind. Acts 2.38. We confess our belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Romans 10.10. 10, and we, we are baptized. Galatians 3.26.27. We were sanctified, set apart by God as one of his holy possessions for the purpose of leading a holy life. And as our brother John Lasseter told me on the day he baptized me five years ago this past August, I'd taken the first step, but not the final one. He counseled me. He says, your faith is going to be challenged throughout your life. He encouraged me to get involved in Bible study so that the roots of my faith might grow deep and bear fruit. So now that we've been sanctified, what's the next step? Or 
I think a year and a half ago, Dave Pope was up here speaking and he said, so what's next? Well, we have some options. One of the options is to adopt the life of Sisyphus. And unfortunately, the next step in our spiritual journey is too often the lost step, El Paso Perdido. So if you want to go back to a life of maintaining an empty and hopeless life in vain, the life of Sisyphus is the path. The option, you can become a Rhodes Scholar. And they, so the people from the University of Arizona here today might say, see, they don't teach you to spell at ASU. It's not Rhodes Scholar. Rhodes Scholar, R-H-O-D-E-S, is a scholar. It's a postgraduate scholarship to Oxford. This I borrowed from a friend of mine who's a preacher at our congregation in St. George, Rob Fuller. And he expressed, he was giving a sermon about road scholars. He had encountered them, he was in Air Force at the uh, different missile silo bases. And during that, he found another people who had been trained and everything the way they should be but they had just given up. They had stopped growing. They were just punching the clock and waiting for the next day to come. And, and there was no growth left in, in there. And Rob called them R-O-A-D, retired on active duty. <laughs> They'd stopped growing, thinking that they've done all they need to do. But Rob's analogy was to Christians asking, have you become a Rhodes Scholar? Have you come into church, occupied a pew? I checked the box. I'm good with God. Luckily for me, I was surrounded by at least four good men who were not Rhodes Scholars. Okay. Okay. Let's get back. I'll try it there. Hold on. <coughs> see if it'll keep going. Hold on. Okay. Be back. We're good. Okay. So we can be road scholars, but it's not a good option. So the next option is growth. So growth, um, something that begins at sainthood when we are sanctified and goes on for the rest of the li our lives. We all need to be growing in our Christ-likeness, in our attitude, in our conduct, in our behavior. As we grow, we are being conformed to the likeness of his son. 1 Peter 14, 16 says, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. God's telling us to grow beyond our ignorance. And by ignorance we mean beyond the infancy of our knowledge. He wants us to be holy. And in Ephesians 4.1 it says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. As, as his um, saints, we are called to, by being ch children of God. We are called of children of God. He is asking us to grow into that. go. Philippians 1.6 says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. In the New King James Version, it says, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion 
until the day of Jesus Christ. He begins a work in us, shaping us, molding us, conforming us unto the likeness of his Son. 1 John 1, 3 talks about fellowship. And it's important in this stage, from the stage that, be, if you call it a stage, the Bible doesn't really call it a stage, but from the time we become saints until we, the day we draw our last breath. This talks about how the process works. 1 John 1, 3 says, That which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Being a language major, I can't stay away from the Greek stuff. It's too important. The word for fellowship in Greek is koinonia. And it conveys a meaning of joint participation. And when I think of fellowship, I think of joint participation. While God has begun a work in us, we must realize that growth is a joint effort between God and us. God is doing his part, and we all know that God keeps his promises. So he is shaping us and molding us, and we must partner, we must fellowship with him through our own efforts. Philippians 3, uh, 12 through 14. This is Paul speaking of the full knowledge of Christ. The Apostle Paul talks about this ongoing process that will never end in this life. He says about himself in Philippians, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Reaching forward to, in the NIV, they call it straining. Straining toward. Like Paul, we have to press continually toward deeper knowledge of God in Christ. We'll talk a bit uh, for a few minutes about um, the necessity of growth. Growing as a Christian is something that God regards as essential to our Christian life. 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. And then in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. The word desire here in 1 Peter 2, 2, it doesn't just mean want. The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance says it means intensely Crave possession. It's a, a Christian life requires diligence and earnest effort. I have a good friend, a brother in Christ in uh, St. George, Frank Austin. Frank was the son of an elder, for, been an elder for 20 years. And when Frank told me the story once about, he went to his dad and he goes, I don't know if I want to go to church anymore. He goes, I'm not getting anything out of it. And Frank's dad, who was a quiet man, said, well, son, I need to ask what you're putting into it. It's a story about having to make our own effort, fellowshipping with God. The scriptures are abundant on the necessity of growth. Spiritual maturity is achieved through becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. And I want to ask you this question. If we don't know him well enough through the scriptures, how can we become more like him? 
Effort is required. Second Peter 1.3 says, As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. And then additionally in Colossians 1.10 it says that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. This is a piece of scripture that John brought to us last week in his lesson for us. Being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So these words that are up there, here's a little Greek lesson. There are two words for for knowledge in Greek. One is gnosis, which you may recognize from Gnostic or agnostic. It is a general general level of knowledge, more of an entry level of knowledge. But the words he's using in knowledge and the words I'm finding in in, uh, my lesson today for you is the word epignosis. And in these two cases, um, epignosis, according to Vines, says it expresses a fuller or full knowledge, a greater participation by the knower in the object known, thus more powerfully influencing him. And as we saw just a minute ago in 1 John 1, 3, it refers to our fellowship with the Father and the Son as being joint participation. Second Peter chapter 1, 4 through 7, most of you would recognize these as the uh, Christian grace, described as the Christian graces. They describe godly qualities and characteristics that we should aspire to have. And it says, By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. Peter is teaching us that as we add these godly qualities to our lives and to our faith, we grow to become more like Jesus. We become more godly, more holy in our behavior and in our character. And it enables, it enables us to be fruitful in our daily lives. Peter's describing the necessity of growth, giving all diligence to growth in your faith. Diligence in in the Greek is a word spude, S-P-O-U-D-E. It has a little tilde over the E, so I hope that's the way it's pronounced. It refers to haste and carefulness. We are being encouraged to hasten our learning, to hasten our growth in the love of Jesus. Luke 13, 24 says, Strive to enter the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Strive in the Greek is agonizomai. This is a cognate. In foreign language, when you have a word you know, like in English we know a word like, um, like problem. In Spanish, that word is problema. It's almost spelled the same, it's pronounced almost the same, it has the same meaning. Those are cognates, and agonizomai is a cognate for agonize. And it means to struggle, again, illustrating the need for our effort. So under purpose of growth, two questions. Why should we grow? Why should we intensely crave strive and hasten to add deeper knowledge and godly characteristics to our faith. Let's talk about just for a minute what growth is not. 
The purpose of growth is not that we must grow to some predetermined level before we can get into heaven. We were in Christ at the moment we were baptized. So growth is not connected to getting God to love us more. He can't, he can't love us any more than he already does. He sent his son, his only begotten son, to die for us when we were lost. What greater act of love could there be than that? Growing spiritually sustains us. If we look at Matthew 13, uh, verses 3 through 23, this is where he tells the story of the sower. The parable about the sower and the four soils, about the seed that fell in the stony, on the stony places with not much dirt, little chance for roots to take hold. The more we grow, the deeper the roots of our faith. Growth keeps us from dying spiritually. For things that don't grow, die. Growth keeps the faithful faithful. Growing makes us fruitful. 2 Peter 1.8 says, For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, the word knowledge is epignosis. What Peter is saying is that if you add these qualities to your life and you abound in these qualities, you will be good of you will be full of good works. Because of your knowledge, which is mentioned in verse 5, your godliness in verse 7, your practicing brotherly kindness, and your love. Growing makes us confident that we're going to go to heaven. In 2 Peter 1, 10 through 11, it says, Be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't know, I don't need a show of hands. But is there anyone who wouldn't want to make their election sure? If we strive and hasten to grow in this way, we will be faithful and fruitful. And we're going to feel confident that we're going to go to heaven. Not because we've earned it, but because these things will ensure that we have remained faithful. Finally, Growing helps us to glorify God. It's a pretty simple formula. The more we grow, the more fruit we bear. The more we reflect the life of Jesus, the more we glorify God. So how do these things become a reality? When we grow, we are growing in our knowledge of him our relationship with him, our passion for him, our love for him, our desire for him, our hunger and thirst for righteousness. And in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, 6, it says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Folks, something is happening inside of us. God is affecting change in our lives when we, want, when we say we want to walk in his ways. In other words, we want to lead a holy life. When people meet us, we want them to see a reflection of Jesus in us. So how do these things become a reality? 
1 John 3, verses 2 and 3, says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. I want you to be holy just as I am holy. From John's lesson last week, and I thank John for letting me borrow this from his note from last week. Bodhi was talking about um, pleasing God. We were to, the conversation came up about what do we look like? What will we look like? What will it be like? And uh, that day after the service, Ken Dart and I were talking for a minute. And uh, we were talking about this part where he says, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. And of all the people worried about what they're going to look like, Ken said, well, we shall be like him. That's good enough for me. When God set us apart... As his children, he began a good work in us to shape us, mold us, to conform us unto the likeness of his precious son. And he will carry it on to completion when Jesus returns, perfecting us unto the likeness of Jesus Christ. So here's our old pal Sisyphus. And I have a question. Is this you? Are you leading the stagnant life of Sisyphus, just rolling that rock every day, one day blurring into the next, mere existence, with no hope or a future, never to realize why God put you here in the first place? Or are you a road scholar, having taken the first step but are really just retired on active duty, just checking the box, having lost your craving for God and to grow. Whatever your situation is, God has a plan for you. And if you are so inclined, you may come forward at this moment and he can make it happen as we stand and sing. <laughs>